This is the weekly wrap-up presented by The Conversation Project. I'm Jay Cleveland Payne, and this is simply the wrap-up of news stories we posted all week on The Conversation Project feeds on Facebook and Twitter, and talked about, well, at least most of them throughout the week in the things you might have heard videocasts and podcasts every single weekday morning. There, we give you the latest in news you can get your day started and the news that get, get us conversational with some perspective added. And this is mostly chosen by you, but of course vetted by me to make it into the perfect storyline. For this podcast, we go straight to the stats and use your peer engagement score to present the data-driven top 10 stories of the week. We also give a little perspective into the stories aren't quite there called also rands, we call them that, stories that are 11 through 15 of the week and a little bit of love, just some because you gave it no love, to a story we call the almost relevant story of the week. This week it's number 244. The story is usually more relevant than it should be irrelevant. It's usually something that's kind of should have been important or should have been interesting. But for some reason, no engagement or very little engagement by you. We'll explain how the feeds work, how your engagement run things around here in the, in a bit as we get through the most of the headlines. And we'll explain how the podcast sets up another podcast. This one sets up the Story of the Week podcast. We'll go deeper, editorialize into one of the top 10 stories you selected this week. And we won't know what they are until we get through the headline list. So for one, help us out by going to our website. This is the conversation project.com. And two, Email me with all your suggestions, your jeers, whatever, at the conversation inbox at gmail.com. We'll explain how you can help us with the feeds a little bit later on. Let's get into the stories with the countdown for this week. Going from 10 to 1, the stories per your engagement that are the tops for the week ending the 5th of August 2023. For the number 10 story, we give you this headline, four killed, two hurt in separate aircraft accidents in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Now, we'll give you a deeper detail about the feeds, as we said a little bit later, but this is a story where, because of the feeds, because we chase Facebook and Twitter stats, this is a story that did not really make it into the range at all for anything to talk about, but because of some late push, if you will, and literally because Facebook made it happen, it's a top 10 story. Otherwise, it would not even made it in the top 25 in the listing anywhere near to look at. Now, two people were killed and two injured in a mid-air collision between a Rotaway 162F helicopter and an ELA Eclipse 10 gyrocopter in the area of Whitman Regional Airport. Meanwhile, at about 9 a.m. as well on Saturday, a small plane carrying two people crashed into Lake Winnebago near Oshkosh, with the FAA said. Both people aboard that issue, that plane died. Uh, this was a very, very sad incident where two air, mid-air collisions happening in the same general area. Nothing to be said about weather, nothing to be said about anything foul play-ish. It's just one of those things that just sort of happened. Interesting enough that you got enough engagement to put it in there. Very interesting that it made its way into the top 10, even when we had no eyes on this one throughout the week in things you might have heard. At number nine, Google Beach serial killing suspect Rex Hewerman gets first 2,500 pages of evidence in the case and still insists police got the wrong guy. Rex Hewerman, who has been charged with, a, I believe, three, although they found a fourth body this week, so maybe he'll be charged with four people that they could connect to uh, some serial killings of sex workers in the Google uh, Beach area. Got a chance to see some of the evidence, see some of it, because 2,500 pages of it was presented for him in court. The investigation has gone on for 13 years, and he is still saying he's the wrong person. Now, the headline is a bit of a jab-ish from Insider, basically trying to you know, be funny about it. But the 59-year-old was ha was handcuffed and stared straight into the, the audience ahead while the briefing went through to talk about what's going on. Because of the seriousness of the charges, he's been on suicide watch since he was arrested two weeks ago now, almost three weeks ago. Um, the architect is accused of killing four people and has been convicted um, and has been convicted without seeing a shred of evidence uh, or, or uh, actually not quite convicted because the, the case is going through but he's accused but they have the evidence now here lots of DNA evidence lots of things going on lots of things going forward now this story is getting more headlines for so the outsource, outside things going on the talk from the wife or almost soon be ex-wife as she is divorcing him and the adult children about the treatment that they've been dealing with. They basically went through and ransacked the house and destroyed property they shouldn't have. Uh, they've been surveilling the family, waiting for people to talk and stuff, which they shouldn't have. They, uh, the, they are still in communication with their father and their husband, although very limited because lawyers say, be careful what you say at this point. Uh, we're going to find more about this one as it goes along for the case part and for the family part as this is one 
that has a lot of true crime folks kind of chopping your lips, but not quite with the details they want at the moment. Many of the stories in the conversation project that we talk about are things that are, you know, personal matter and we probably shouldn't be dealing into. A lot of the relationships, a lot of separations, oddly enough. This is a big one that we're dealing with because this is one that affects the people, at least the people of Canada directly and all around based on sort of ripple effects. At number eight, Justin Trudeau to separate from wife Sophie. Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, and his wife Sophie Gregor Trudeau separated after 18 years of marriage. They have signed legal separation documents, so it's legal. They're not just staying in other places. It's basically done, and the work to go forward for whatever happens next is going on. They're asking for privacy for the couple, especially for the children. Trudeau has two children, two youngest children, and part of the luster that is Justin Trudeau being good looking Canadian guy is that he has the wife and the children that he goes home to and he does his things with the children he's a family man that's a good thing and it's he's gonna continue to be a good father to his children as we expect however the the having that attaching on of going home to the wife and children no longer exists if they actually truly divorce and there's all the issues that goes along with that one. We will see if Justin Trudeau will survive his political stuff because that's a whole nother issue that he's dealing with and his personal stuff with his wife and his children going forward. We hope for the best. We pray for a simple and just civil um, either reconnection to the union. That's going to go great, not just for eyeball sake or a separation that is mutual to all and good for the children. Because literally, I mean, it's cliche, but it really is about the children, not about anyone's actual political life when it comes down to things. This story was so big last week that it helped us get a boost for some extracurricular things we did. And it was just so big, it lasted as a number seven story for the week. And this is one that's got a little bit of extra commentary, a little bit of extra pizzazz to it. So let's get into it. Number seven, DeSantis rocked by black Republican revolt over slavery comments. Now, when we talked about this last week, we really focused on the fact that the black Republicans weren't happy with the new Florida curriculum for African-American studies, black history studies for high school. Essentially, the line, which seemed like a throwaway line, saying that many slaves learn skills that were great for getting jobs after slavery when it's sort of not really said that many slaves were just sort of picking cotton or chopping tobacco or pulling wheat and that's not necessarily a great job skill for going forward not all of them learned blacksmithing and horse working and of course some of them were just working in the house as housekeepers that's not great for jobs as it is what happened as you would expect the black republicans actually said something about hey this is not so great we love our party, but this is not what we should be pushing. And in response, most of the black Republicans got blasted for not standing by DeSantis. Now, as this thing got further along, we got deeper into details of some other people to talk about. Number one is uh, Representative Byron Donalds, who's a growing guy in the Republican Party as a black Republican in the House and from Florida. And he is essentially backing Donald Trump, which is part of why he's getting a lot of his buzz from it. But um, this is one of the things that he has definitely broke away from the party to talk about this one. The other one is Tim Scott, the South Carolina senator who is actually running for president and is at the moment, as DeSantis is faltering in his run for president, looks like he's taking up the slack for for him. He may be the next number two guy coming up there if Vivek Ramaswamy does not find a way to make number two in the polls. DeSantis uh, essentially did two things. One, he had the out saying, you know, I don't actually make the rules. It's done by the Florida folks and some black poll folks actually did this. And those black folks said they weren't exactly happy with the way they present this thing. And two said, no, you know what? It is true. They learned something. Good stuff. Now, from this, there was the comparison to how, you know, the people who survived the Holocaust uh, learned how to be great survivalists and um, people who survived in Native American lands. Uh, the, the diseases brought over by the Europeans learned to have great immune systems, which were mostly mocking and meant, meant to be funny and just sort of ironically point out that what you're saying makes no sense. Also, what said a lot was the fact that, you know, white people didn't invent slavery, which was just really, really dumb because when you want to sort of uh, you just kind of defend dumb stuff you usually defend it with dumber stuff my words and other people's words but my words specifically the Santos is still dealing with this one he had some other issues with uh, education including the fact that um the ap ap classes had to back away from teaching 
other classes because of uh, sexuality in the classroom. And then the College Board said, this doesn't make an AP class. And so they had to back away from that one. That's not in this headline. This is one from last week. We'll talk probably more about the other one coming forward. The number six story is sports, sort of. Big Ten examining potential additions of Oregon, Washington, California, and Stanford to conference. I believe four, two of those four schools essentially have the you know go ahead to go in there. The other two are still working on it. In 2022, venture capitalists and private equity types discussed trying to buy a conference and investing in them to make base level college athletics work out. From that, uh, we see a lot of money going into sports teams, sports leagues sports stations and trying to make sure that the Pac-12, the Big 12, the ACC, and maybe the Big 10 can be larger powerhouse type of conferences, much like the uh, SEC is the big grand A of them all, whether you want to say that or not. It essentially kind of is the big bully of all the conferences in football and some money wanted to go in there to make things work out. With that, the thought of maybe realigning a whole lot of stuff to make things work out better for the teams, not so much for the regions going forward. With that, more teams are joining the Big Ten because Big Ten seems to be the best place to go. And with that, there may be about 20 teams in the Big Ten when things come out and buyouts or contracts, things happen going forward. There's a lot of shuffling going, a lot of things. So check out the link in the description so you can go deeper into the story. And like I said, there have been some advances because I think um, both Oregon and Washington essentially have the green light. We'll see what happens uh, on that going forward uh, for these stories. But looks like the Big Ten is getting bigger. We know the Pac-12 is getting smaller, but they're trying to lure other teams to them to deal with it. One of the weird things that happens with this is the fact that the teams in these conferences, as opposed to be regional, turn into national, although travel things aren't so much an issue anymore. They don't turn to be, you know, all the folks on the West Coast, all the folks in the East Coast. Southeastern Conference is not so much Southeast, but the whole swath of the South plus a little bit of Midwest it gets weird. It gets interesting. It may lead to bigger football, may lead to better football, may lead to more money for the kids. We shall see. Did Stephen Amell put his foot in the mouth this last week? Former Arrow star Stephen Amell condemns SAG after a strike. Let me read you some details from this thing. So what actually happened was he spoke out against the ongoing labor uh, action, which is, of course, the strike that's happening. And he did this at GalaxyCon in North Carolina over the weekend. Now, the words to effect, he said, was he supports his union and all his brothers and sisters. The strike, not exactly the greatest idea. Now, why is this a problem? It's okay to support your brothers and not really want the strike if they vote for it, because everyone didn't vote for a strike, obviously. The problem was he was at GalaxyCon. He was at a convention. He was promoting his new show, Heels, or the second season of the show, Heels, and doing some things that probably he shouldn't be doing, including promoting new shows and doing more stuff while the strike's going on. The rules engagement of what happens in a strike happens where, you know, people are not supposed to be pushing things that are going to be in the best interest of the networks and the studios. Heels being on Stars, I guess technically a streaming service, although it still is more or less a cable channel, is an issue going forward. Now, the fact that many other stars from many other movies essentially are walking off from their promotions. In fact, as the strike was, was announced, many stars who were at premieres like went the red carpet, took some pictures, and then went home. This is something that no one else is doing. Now, actors are not permitted to promote struck work, so Armel was frustrated with his inability to promote heels going forward because he couldn't he can't go out on TV, he can't do big part packets. So we did the panel at GalaxyCon to sort of do a little something. This, of course, left a bad taste in the mouth for SAC aftra in what Amel is doing. His frustrations, you know, very viable, but still not exactly in support of the Brethren of the Strike. As he says, he supports them, yet he's not quite supporting them. We had a lot of stories from the weekend that carried over because it was just a big weekend of stuff that was just essentially gobsmacking people in the face. Here's a story from Saturday that really got in people's skins. Candace Owens sparks controversy for stating women are the reason for societal ill. That's the number four story for this week. And it's a couple things because there was sort of a mix up when we sort of produced these things. There were two competing stories going back and forth. Number one, she did an interview with Andrew Tate last weekend, which popped up uh, early Saturday morning and got lots of hits because it's Andrew Tate and it's Candace Owen, two people people love to hate, two people people have reasons to hate, saying things that people should hate on. 
my words and the words of other folks. This from the Shine My Crown blog uh, going on to spark controversy from a actual episode of her actual program that she produces uh, daily where she talked about women essentially the the liberal women who are of course you know all into not falling in line and being good good wives and things like that are the reason why society is kind of stuck uh the headlines are a lot of it about transgenderism and thinks that because uh we are women or they are women and they're not exactly trying to be good women it's the reason why society is it's all sucked up right now men dress as women are not women and women who are you know, falling for this thing because they're all sisters is a bad thing and is a societal ill. Now, like I said, when I first read this thing on Monday for the things you might have heard podcast because of the font, it looked like I said societal three. So I was trying to look for like what societal one and two were because, you know, I'm just an eight year old got kid at heart. But essentially, Candace Owen, once again speaking, Candace Owens, once again speaking, like a crazy person doing what she is doing. I used to have a sort of a shtick with Candace Owen where I just like wonder like maybe she just needs a hug and maybe she needs somebody to love her. And maybe she is uh, grew into maybe she's just a grifter and knows who her audience is and is playing to them. But the more she does this, the deeper she gets into this and literally the older she is and starts to turn into, you know, you grow into our, our personalities. It's pretty obvious she believes what she's saying she is what she is and if it weren't for the fact she was such a fringe character that no one would care about except for the fringe characterness of today's society in social media and what we look at she's an extremely sad person I do say prayers literally for Candace Owen to have some sort of whatever uh, so that maybe her heart can grow three times, three times as three sizes one day and just move on from that but we shall see Ariana Grande is extremely interesting to you people, so she keeps coming up in our conversational projects. She's number three this week about giving Ethan Slater space as he works out things with his estranged wife. Ariana Grande last week, we were talking about the fact that she was linked to dating SpongeBob SquarePants, the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, in which SpongeBob SquarePants' wife, who has a real name, said, no, it's not happening. Find out that she's actually dating a guy named Ethan Slater, who's uh, some sort of actor of some sort, I guess, and kind of famous. I don't really care. But the big thing that you care about is the fact that they're dating and the fact that Ethan is still actually still married to his wife and they need to work some things out, fix some things, and not hang out together. In the meantime, Ariana Grande was seen with some other dude later in the week, so we'll see how that plays out. But you people really care about Ariana's well-being, and since you do, we're going to talk about it. Because literally, you guys told me that's what we're talking about. The well-being of this young lady has been a big deal as people have kind of gotten into her business. The earlier post we had this week dealt with her mother saying, please, we're going to work this thing out back away. We're talking about Alicia Navarro. The later edition story makes the story get even, even weirder. Alicia Navarro flees Montana apartment over older man overnight. With older man, older night. Now, essentially, Alicia Navarro is 18 years old. She showed up in a police station uh, this week to say, I'm not a missing person, even though I've been missing since I'm 14, but I'm here because I need to get a driver's license, and you can't do that if you're a missing person, if you don't exist. People sort of blinked when, when what was going on, and she went home for the moment. What happened later in the week is she's fled with an adult, an older man that she's apparently been staying with for some time. Now, there is some idea that the 14-year-old at the time was lured away by an adult. However, um, that adult and this man are probably not the same person. They're assuming they're not the same person. Uh, people who lived in the apartment nearby saw essentially them leaving in the middle of the night, going through, uh, just packing up things and leaving, fleeing to wherever they're going to, probably for some privacy as this whole thing plays out. This is, I believe, the third story of a young person being found later in life and finding out that the details of their disappearance have been a bit exaggerated. The, the biggest one we remember is the, the young man in Texas who was just sort of found, you know, um, unresponsive to be found out that he was basically kidnapped by his mother and was living in the house the whole time for the whole, literally the whole time. This one is still playing itself out. This one's still in the creepy stage because they all have a creepy stage and we will continue to post it out there and keep up with it as it goes along and you will probably continue to tell us to talk about it this is of course big deal because it's the number two story 
for the week. As far as the number one story for the week is, this one we give it extra fanfare because it earned it. This one is by leaps and bounds, the number one story by a percentage of two, 100% more engaging than the story previous for Alicia Navarro. And by the story at number 244, more engagement by 630, 630,900%. That's a lot of percents in there. Uh, this story was a top on Twitter because Twitter is there. And it got the engagement for everyone looking at all the stories who worked all week at 29.01%. Almost 30% of everybody who went through our website and clicked on our feeds and saw something saw this story and engaged in this story. And it's a big deal. We love my girl. If you're seeing the video, you already see the headline. The headline reads, Cardi B's alleged microphone from viral video could raise $100,000 for charity. The story behind the story is last weekend, somebody in Vegas was at a concert where Cardi B was performing on one of those intimate stages, tossed a drink on Cardi B as she was on stage because she thought it was funny, I guess. Cardi B threw a microphone at her. The lady who tossed a drink at Cardi B wanted some charges because it was battery, having something thrown at her. Las Vegas police essentially threw out the charges and said, you shouldn't have thrown the drink at the lady. By the way, she's Cardi B, back up the hell up. That microphone, the um, the event coordinator who um, who 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 ran the show, has taken the microphone. is going to put it up for auction, and it's going to um, maybe fetch about a hundred thousand dollars, and that money is going to charity. Congratulations for Cardi B for making that. Now, by the way, Cardi B did have a flub this week where as the back and forth on her actual charges were going on, she made the statement that the fact that her lawyers were Jewish and were going to basically take care of this BS. The BS part is true. The Jewish part probably should not have been said out loud, even if she thought it. But in the actuality, the BS part was taken care of. No charges against Cardi B. No charges against the lady on the uh, th through the drink as well to try to make it all go away. And maybe some charity is going to get some money for a mishap that should not have happened. Now, let me say this right now. People, please stop throwing things at artists on stage. Just don't do it. It's dumb. It's dumb. Oh, by the way, it's really dumb. Those are the top 10 stories for the week as per you, going from 10 to 1 to make it a bit of mystery, if you will. So from those top 10 stories, we do a thing where we take those headlines, mix them out of order and sort of battle them against themselves to see which story would survive in the brackets sort of style of battle. And we come up with a story that we're going to do for the story of the week. This is the podcast coming from this podcast where we'll go deeper in detail of one of these headlines for this week. Our top story happens to be the headline at number five, which is Stephen Armel, the former Arrow star, speaking out against the SAG Afra strike. Uh, the second story in second place is a story that came up at number 10, and that's is, I'm sorry, a story that came at number one, that was Cardi B and the microphone for charity. It almost made the ranks there, but we thought talking about Stephen Armel would be a bit bigger going forward uh, because we've talked a lot about Cardi B. So let's talk about the writer strike in a bit and what it means to basically stock, stick by your buys, stick by your guys, stay with your buddies, stay in line with what's going on as opposed to not quite being a scab, but trying to make it on your own because, you know, it is about money on both ends. How can these actors and writers make a little money on the things they've already done when supposedly they're supposed to be mad enough to not let the, the studios make money on the stuff they've already done? And they're going to do it anyway. It'll sound more elegant than that when we get to the headline story for the story of the week. So look for that in a separate feed. Story of the week for this week will deal with Stephen Armell and how he spoke out against the strike, but still says he supports the strikers, which seems like a bit of contradiction. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to get some ads in, do some promotions, and come back to wrap up the show. When we wrap things up, we'll tell you about the almost rants, the stories that were not quite there, 11 through 15, and show some love, some love. More love than you guys showed for the story at 244 this week, which is the almost relevant story of the week. That is coming up in a moment. Just hang tight. About two and a half minutes for some ads and stuff here on the weekly wrap up for, from the Conversation Project. That's us for the week ending August the 5th, 2023. While you may not believe it from the words coming out of my mouth, we make the words much, much prettier by using Grammarly here for the Conversation Project. Grammarly is an app I've been using for way too long to even kind of go into the whole background. And it is something that I 
essentially have to do. I'm extremely bad at writing, oddly enough. You may have seen that from the words that are being said, but I'm bad at actually writing out in real time. I, I type poorly, I misspell things, and everything is just sort of a jumbled mess. Every time I send an email, every time I make a note, every time I have to write a letter, I run it through Grammarly and it makes me feel better. So, because it makes the words look better. Now, it is its own separate AI tool that makes your grammar check and does your checking for your different types of style guides and plagiarism, things like that. So if you are a teacher of some sort, you can use it to catch your people cheating on stuff. If you are just a writer in general, you can use it to make your writing look better. If you're just a general person who wants to make your words look better, this could be the thing that happens. It has attachments, it has apps that go along with it all over the place. It has plugins and extensions that go into your Microsoft Office and your Google Docs, so you can just instantly do all your checks. And everything gets checked to almost perfection. It'll help you upgrade your score for what's going on. And I feel really, really smart when I get my Grammarly reports that says how smart I am for using the words. Because I use a lot of big words, and I spell them poorly, which is why I use Grammarly. You should try it as well. Go to this is the conversation project.com slash grammarly. This is the conversation project.com slash grammarly. One more time. This is the conversation project.com slash grammarly. This is an affiliate link, so we get a bit of commission for you stopping by the Grammarly store, if you will, and checking out the product. And they will take good care of you. It costs you nothing extra to help us out. And like I said, it helps us out a bunch if you will try that. Go to our sponsors page and see a various other sponsors we have. But this week, we're spotlighting, and because we do a lot of writing here, the Grammarly app, the Grammarly program, the Grammarly website, Grammarly on its own because it's a great thing. Check it out at this is conversationproject.com slash Grammarly. The Conversation Project's website, this is a conversationproject.com. This is where you can find all the things about the Conversation Project. We have the replays, the archives, if you will, of things you might have heard, plus the weekly wrap-ups and story of the week, plus links to find us in various places, including on YouTube, on TikTok, on Twitter, on Instagram, where we are doing other things and trying to be more conversational, and ways to stay in conversation with us. Email us at the conversation inbox at gmail.com. Respond to any of the posts that have been on the website, and we'll respond back to you there. Uh, check out our sponsors page. Check out some other details we have there. And of course, if you think we're doing fairly good for you guys, check out our partnerships page. Go to this is a conversation project.com slash partnerships and see if there's a way that we can partner up together to do better. This thing here, along with everything we do all week long, takes a lot of time, effort, and resources. And we could use your help, to be honest. So if you think we're doing a pretty good job, we, this is the ask. We ask you to consider partnering up. If that's not well where you are at the moment, stay with us. We're asking you to stay with us. Go to our feeds on Facebook and Twitter, facebook.com slash this is the conversation project and twitter.com or x.com if you will. Go to th underscore conversation. Follow our feeds where we post news stories every 50 minutes. Like, love, hate, share, and engage in those new stories. The more engagement the story gets, the better chance we have of talking about it come the next day. Uh, we talk about 10 stories on Monday, 8 stories Tuesday through Friday, based on your engagement, the top stories get up there. And then at the end of the week, we give you the top stories here in this podcast. You tell us what to talk about. You tell us what's engaging. You tell us what stories are the tops, literally every single day. And, of course, email us at the conversation project, the conversation inbox, I'd say, at gmail.com so that we can have deeper discussions. We thank you for everything you want to provide for us. The most important thing is email us for a conversation and follow us on the feeds. We are back from commercials and from promotion. Hopefully you didn't take too long or you just, you know, maybe you just sort of 15, 15, 15. We're okay with that. We're glad you're back for this. Now let's get to stories to give you some perspective. The ones that didn't quite make it into range because they're not top 10, they're literally 11 through 15. The almost rands for this week start off with this headline. Angus Cloud, breakout star of Euphoria, is dead at 25. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time with these, these, but we did talk about this one a few times throughout the week in some various updates. We believe he died of a possible overdose, but it, the... The shock of the actual thing happening. He died near his family in his home in Oakland, California. Everyone said goodbyes. There's a lot of fan love and a lot of star love going out to the star of this person playing a creepy drug dealer of all things. Um, a lot of love going out to Angus Cloud, who passed away this week at the age of 25. 
at number 12, Jonathan Major's domestic violence trial pushed to September, a late addition to what happened for the week, uh, but something that we've been following for a while. Jonathan Majors is a big deal or should be a big deal uh, because of one, him being starring in the Marvel stuff and as promotional products come out, he's not been wiped away from the slate quite yet. Number two, this is actually a really big deal for the slate of famous people and domestic violence. Now, this one goes both ways. Jonathan Majors is being uh, sued and uh, being pursued for uh, domestic violence against a partner. He's also countersuing the partner for domestic violence on his own. So it's one of those, no, actually, she hit me first and hit me harder and I was defending myself type things. This trial has been pushed further and further and further, not so much for the politics, but I guess because trial dockets. September 5th so far is the date that we shall see the star of Creed 3 and the star of many Marvel things to come, we assume, happening to go forward. Misdemeanor charges of assault and harassment is what's going on there. Uh, they're saying NYPD and the justice system are using racial bias. It's a witch hunt. And of course, she actually did all of the actual domestic violence. We shall see. Much longer than that one that I thought I was going to say, but it could go deeper to that one. At number 13, Judge denies Trump's bid to quash Fulton County DA's probe into efforts to overturn Georgia's election results. As you know, we didn't talk about Donald Trump getting his actual third indictment federally by Jack Smith, which was odd because it was all the news all day long, all week long, but it didn't make range for you guys this week. So I guess you're tired of Trump. You weren't tired of Trump earlier in the week or last weekend when the whole deal was the fact that Fulton County uh, still gets a chance to take their bite of the apple. Uh, Fonnie Willis can still go ahead and put her charges in. She says she's going to do it within the month or so by September 5th, I believe. So within a month, there's barricades up. There's all sort of crazy happening in Georgia. Uh, if it weren't for the fact that he had this other indictment that sort of entangles the Georgia indictment, we may have heard something. So we shall see if Georgia will take their crack with a state trial. Now, a state trial means Trump can't make it go away if he's president because he doesn't have the rights to rule out states, which he Learn, should have learned when he was asked in the state to look for all those extra votes. Yankees, Domenico, German, entering treatment for alcohol abuse, placed on a restricted list. Number 14 story this week. It's pretty simple, that one. Go to the link to go deeper into this one. Uh, Domingo uh, Germain was um, one of the hot pitch, hottest pitchers for the season. Then he got scratched later in the last couple of plays, and now he's going on to an alcohol abuse treatment. We're waiting to see, hopefully, a great response from the treatment center and just him being back as a great person and let him get back to work you know he's got a great skill let him get back to work let him get get better so he can go move on and finally at 15 mark hamill is unhappy with twitter's transformation into x calls a boycott the boycott was supposed to happen on august 1st so it basically sort of fizzled out but there was a lot of chatter in the x world about shouldn't we be boycotting? Are we supposed to be someplace else? And many people, many famous folks, and I guess some not so famous folks, did not use Twitter for the day. So the numbers for the Monday or for, or for the Tuesday, the first, were probably a bit off, a bit off. Whatever day the first is, I think the first was. I'm sorry, the first was Tuesday. Yes, I'm losing my mind here. Um, but so numbers for Tuesday, the first, were probably a bit off for the Twitter slash X move. The other X things that happened this week was the big X that was put on the, the high quarters that be taken down because it's illegal. And Elon, you know, said some things and did some things and whatever. But Mark Hamill tried to launch a large boycott. I don't think it made much of a difference. It got heard, got seen, but I don't think it really made much difference. The biggest thing is we're finding out, and I'm going real long on this one, is that um, threads is not sticking because it doesn't have the features and Twitter is overcoming because even though they hate Elon Musk, people still like the Twitter app for what it does. And finally, the story that we told you earlier this uh, this broadcast had so little engagement that our top story this week was more engaging by 630,900%. It's headline for story 244 reads like this marine recruiting surges while other services struggle marine colonel jennifer nash uh decided that she was going to do her best to do more for recruits and she's doing her best now uh as the head of recruiting for the marines she's making it happen she's it's, it's gangbusters the marine corps is actually up 
Um, Marine Corps is actually smaller uh, by, by means of the other services by design. The Marines are essentially an offshoot of the Navy, the, the, the Army of the Navy, if you will, although they won't, they won't to call it that way. Uh, they're an offshoot of, of land troops to go for naval operations. They are specifically trained for those things. So they have to swim and dive, do all the things that Navy people do. Uh, but do more things like army folks do as in uh, run around and shoot things as opposed to drive around in planes and boats that got all mixed up so sorry about that but the big thing is recruiting is down all over the place for army navy and air force but somehow the marines persevere pretty cool to be a marine i guess i was an air force so i don't know how cool it is to be a marine because i was an air force that was kind of cool too in the meantime Let's go ahead and wrap this thing up for the day. This has been the weekly wrap-up for the week ending August 5th, 2023. My name is Jay Cleveland Payne. Thank you so much for sticking with us for the stories we presented for you that you literally presented to us as top 10. We cannot do this without you. You tell us what stories to talk about in all of us. If you drive the conversation for all of our projects, continue to drive the conversation by going to our feeds on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash this is a conversation project. And I'm going to keep saying Twitter till I have to stop saying Twitter. Twitter.com slash TH underscore conversation. Follow us in the feeds. Engage in the stories. We post every 50 minutes or so uh, all day, all night, all weekend long. And if you think a story is missing, email us at the conversation inbox at gmail.com. We'll see what we did and how to put more engagement on those stories. Sometimes it's a story that you love that just not enough people love. It just works out that way. Stick around or stick around in your podcast feed and look for the feed for the Story of the Week podcast. We'll give you more details on Stephen Amell and the words he said about the SAG AFTRA group and the words he didn't say out loud about the SAG AFTRA group, which is probably the biggest part of the story. And oh, by the way, make sure you are staying limber, staying hydrated, and staying on task for all the grand things you are here to do on this planet called Earth because we ain't got no other planets. And the folks around you need you with them and not, you know, going to other planets. I am Jay Cleveland Payne. If you if you enjoyed what you saw or heard today, uh, email us. Let us know. Stop by our partnerships page and see there's ways that we can connect to work on more things. And if you see something that was uh, glaringly, obviously bad or something that was glaringly, obviously good, as we did a couple of changes in this week's podcast, we're growing and learning how we do, do these things on and on. Send me an email, tell me what was good, tell me what was not good, and we'll do more of the good and less of the not good. With that, we're wrapping up for this week. Stop by for every single morning at 5.50 a.m. Look for us on Facebook and on YouTube for the Things You Might Have Heard video cast. That's live at 5.50 a.m. Central Time every single weekday morning. And it replays all over the world on the Internet via podcasts and via the videos themselves. We're back for working on another podcast, and we're back in seven days to talk about the top 10 stories that you gave us to talk about for the week what will they be who will outlast the other stories all week long we won't know until next week so come back next week and we'll find out exactly who is the tops in the weekly wrap-up from the conversation project <laughs>